Okay, so today we're just going to be talking about um, nutrition, resetting your diet if it needs it. Um, just the objectives for today, we're going to kind of look at um, what a standard American diet is, or the acronym, the SAD diet. Um, <laughs> how ironic. <laughs> uh, and maybe how much of that typical American diet we're consuming, and how can we transform that? How can we take small steps, doable steps um, in home with what we're cooking, how we're shopping, how we're preparing our meals, packing them for ourselves and our families, to shift it more towards a healthy eating plate that's going to help us um, in all aspects of our life. And then we're going to um, look at that plate as a whole, what's, what's all on it, and then um, get some ideas for, um, for meals, for mealtime planning. So for breakfast, lunch, um, I'm sure that'll roll over into your dinner planning as well, and then snacks. So as we kind of go through this, feel free to just ask questions um, if you have a question that comes up um, anytime. So what's on the standard American plate? What are we seeing um, being served on a typical plate? Um, well, I'll kind of go through a few of these slides. So we're seeing a lot um, across America, a lot of increase in fats. And unfortunately, they're not the good quality fats that we want to be seeing. We're seeing really low quality, saturated, hydrogenated oils. Um, and these are coming mostly in processed packaged foods um, because they help those foods stay fresh and preserved. So we're seeing a really high increase on our plate in fats um, and ones that aren't going to help our heart health or our bodies. We're seeing a lot of added sugars, artificial sweeteners um, in those more processed foods as well, um, salt, a ton of added salt, um, and more just processed convenient foods. Our world is really um, running at an extremely fast pace, and many of us, I know I feel that way in a week, that it's really hard to keep up. So we're shifting our nutrition, we're shifting our diet, what we're eating, because that's something that is time-saving. So we're going more convenience and less quality. With all those changes, um, we're losing fiber. Uh, we're losing really high quality foods, fiber, complex carbohydrates, and we're taking away a lot of those plant-based foods. So just a couple um, charts that we'll scroll through quickly here. Looking at um, this calorie intake is looking at someone who's consuming about 2,700 calories. So maybe higher than some of you, maybe lower than some of you. But um, what we're seeing is that a really big intake, let me try this laser, um, the grains, uh, of that 2,700 calorie diet, 580 of those calories are consumed in grains. Um, and it's looking at the quality of grain, not complex carbohydrates that we can, like I have displayed up here, not whole grains, more refined grains. Um, we have a lot of the sweeteners, so 360, 70 calories in, in just sugar, added sweeteners. Um, and then there's the added fats and oils. And then you see up here, um, in 2,700 calories, almost 2,800 calories, only 200 of those calories are coming from plant-based foods like fruits and veggies. Um, so very little intake. And then meats, eggs, nuts, um, and dairy products. So just to kind of get an idea of where the average standard American plate is getting their calories and nutrition from. Well, is that because yeah. fruit and vegetables are lower calories? It does have to do with that a little bit. So 200 calories in fruits and veggies, it's definitely lower calorie. Um, but this next slide will show you um, that doesn't really line up very much. You know, so across America, Oregon and California, they are the um, greatest consumers of plant-based foods, vegetables, um, with consuming greater than or equal to 1.8 servings of veggies per day. So, um, and then throughout the rest of the United States, definitely way under the recommendations for vegetable intake per day. And then just to highlight again, the increase in grains consumed. So um, just on the bottom, you'll see over time, and this is only going to 2003, and so what we're actually consuming now is quite a bit greater in terms of how much we're consuming in grains. So the solid, oops, so the solid orange line is showing the increase in grain consumption. Um, and we also have to look at, I think I 
I said earlier, the, the quality of grains. You know, the grains that were being consumed in the 1960s um, and earlier were um, how, we, how we're growing grains, how we're modifying them, genetic modification, the quality of our soil. All of these things are impacting the quality of the carbohydrate as well. So just kind of food for thought. Consumption of sugar. Um, increasing significantly, and this again only goes to 2000, so this continues to rise as we're using all sorts of um, sweeteners in our food. Our palate is just growing um, in terms of uh, requiring and wanting that taste for sugar and sweetness in everything that we eat, so um, manufacturers continue to add more and more sweeteners to the foods that we're eating. And then the added fats, I'm not going to spend too much time on these, kind of the graphs all indicate the same thing. The sodium one I think is pretty interesting. Um, the CDC, this um, is from the CDC and they're saying that Americans over the age of two, two years old are consuming um, about, they say 3,000 milligrams of sodium a day, which I find a little bit hard to believe, but um, that's what they're reporting. So you can see here, um, you know, our bodies do need salt, sodium to function, um, but what we actually need to what we're consuming is extremely um, out of balance. And the quality, again, of the salt that we're using is a very refined product. Okay, so enough on that. Let's talk about the fun things. Let's talk about how we can actually shift that plate and get healthier and have more joy and enjoyment in our food. So how do we want our plate to look? That my plate or that healthy plate handout, um, I think we can just spend some time on that. It's a really good reference. I enjoy this. Um, the food pyramid has shifted the old recommendations from um, USDA. They, uh, have, they've shifted the nutrition pyramid to a plate, which I think is a much more useful handout. It's a much more useful tool to have in the kitchen when you're kind of piecing together your meals. Um, so when you look at that plate, what do you see containing, uh, filling half your plate? Veggies. veggies, so low carb veggies, any of them. On the back of that, you'll see kind of a, it's not a comprehensive list, but it's a great list, just showing and add to it. There's not a lot of, uh, th th there's a lot of room for um, adding on your favorite greens or your favorite veggies. Um, but filling half that plate with vegetables, greens, leafy greens, um, anything. There's you know a couple up here to look at, but um, any, any of those veggies. Focus on color, variety. Um, the greater the variety, the better. Every color that we put on our plate has a different spectrum of vitamins, minerals, nutrients, fiber content, all sorts of things. So the more we can have variety every day, you know, every day we might not get in all of the colors, but throughout a week, look at what you're getting throughout the week. Um, eat a variety of whole grains and complex carbohydrates. So popcorn's one of my favorite snacks. It's a great whole grain. Um, what did you say? <laughs> popcorn. Um, so for your meals, trying different, you know, up here we've got uh, rye, um, there's another rye, quinoa, lentils, beans, legumes, um, different types of rices. Um, there's all sorts of um, good whole grains. I think I have a handout on how to cook whole grains. A lot of times it's, um, people don't know how to use them or incorporate them. So there's a cooking guide for how to, how to easily make them in your kitchen. Healthy proteins, um, balancing, balancing the high fiber food, the whole grains, and healthy proteins. Um, so, uh, healthy proteins, fish, chicken, turkey, um, any kind of those, fatty fish, mackerel, tuna, herring, sardines, any of those are all really loaded with nutrients, good omega-3s, um, healthy oils, you know, trying to transition away from some of those um, processed oils using things more like extra virgin olive oils and coconut oils, ghee, butter, um, things that are real oils, real, real fats. Focus on fiber. Where are we getting most of our fiber from? Grains. Grains, whole grains, yeah. Vegetables. 
plant-based foods. You know, we focus a lot on calories, on sugar, on a lot of those things. Fiber is one that I think is the most important. If I ask anyone to track anything in their diet, I always ask them to track fiber. See if you can track how much fiber you get in a daily intake. It's, um, it's a little bit more difficult to do than the calorie. And try to get the um, added salt and sugar out of your diet. Um, looking at ingredient lists, looking at labels um, can be a real eye-opener. Oops. Okay, so some tips for going to the grocery store. How many people dread going to the grocery store? <laughs> Why? <laughs> yep. So it can be um, it can be a daunting task sometimes, but I feel like um, there are some steps that can maybe make it a little bit easier. Um, I think being prepared, spending some time. I mean, the things that I feel like I stay the most organized with are the things I make a list for, I plan it, I know it, I have intention behind it. Um, it's still, you're still gonna have to wait in lines, you're still gonna have to deal with the parking lot, some of those things are inevitable, but I feel like some of the inside, the store um, can become a little bit easier if we're planning ahead and being a little bit more prepared, going to the grocery store with intention, we know what we're doing, we have a list, we're prepared for it. So um, there's so many fun, uh, planners, whatever works for you, whatever you enjoy. Um, but making a grocery list, I think, is really helpful. Planning out your meals, um, looking ahead for that week, knowing what you're having um, can just really help you be successful. Um, take stock of what you have in your house. If you're trying to shift what you have in your house, um, just make note of what you currently have and what you, you know, start making that list. Use your pantry stocking guide that I, ha that I provided and kind of start making note of some of those things that maybe you want to transition out or those ingredients that you want to add in to have your kitchen fully stocked so it makes cooking and mealtime a little bit easier. Um, repurpose your existing stock, either Try to find a purpose for it in your house. You know, try to find a recipe that you can build around that. You know, use what you have and then restock as needed. Um, you know, knowing what your local community has, especially here where we live in Jackson, um, it takes it takes some um, uh, time to figure out what we have and where it's coming from. You know, when those peaches are coming from Salt Lake, when the salmon's coming from Alaska, when, you know, people are shipping things in from different places that we can have, but kind of getting familiar with what our seasonal foods are when they're available and how to really stock up on those. If you have a freezer, if you've got extra cabinet space, you know, really stocking up on those when they're available. Um, using your farmer's market. So just some tips. Anyone else have any great tips that they use for making grocery shopping a little bit easier? Yeah. Do you plan out your meals before you go? I just have certain things that I keep around the house. And just kind of fill out that list when it runs out? It'll help you get through the grocery store faster? Yeah, uh, well, it's been a long time, but I don't need to go down. I don't even know what things I don't need to do. Yeah. Over time. Yeah. And that's oftentimes what I do too. I feel like three meals, three dinner meals, and a few lunches, some breakfasts, I feel like that's a really good start. If you're not doing anything right now, I think three meals a week is a great place to start. Um, there's always leftovers, there's always something that happens during the week. Um, yeah, I think that's a really good start. Hi, Nola. Oh, 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 <laughs> I agree. Hit the periphery. Yeah, I, I totally agree. That's where you're really going to find all of those high fiber foods, the fruits, the veggies, all the, um, all the foods that you want to have. 
really filling the bulk of your cart. There's very few things I think you need from the center aisles. A few things, you know, if you're using canned goods or fats and oils are oftentimes in there. Um, but most of the healthy foods are going to be on the periphery. Um, did you guys get the, the culinary toolkit? Just kind of taking an assessment, too, of what's in there. Um, Okay, I feel like I could spend the whole time on breakfast because I feel like breakfast is the meal that really needs the most attention for most of us. <laughs> I know my house is extremely chaotic in the morning and breakfast can be a really difficult um, meal to get going. I think <clears throat> if we make it a routine, um, how many people are eating breakfast? Good, almost everyone's eating breakfast. You guys already have it dialed. <laughs> yeah, what are you eating for breakfast? <laughs> Um, so that's good. So it's already a part of most of your routines. So that's a big shifting routine is, um, is a, a difficult task. So making a routine, you already have that dialed. So getting organized the night before can also be something that really helps. Um, oftentimes when we wake up in the morning, unforeseen things happen, tantrums, meltdowns, <laughs> can't find the lunchbox because mom took it to work. Um, you know, so getting as organized as you can the night before. Um, Keeping breakfast simple and packing your breakfast to go if there's not enough time. Um, if that means packing your breakfast on the go, I know for me at work, it helps just to, if you have refrigerator space, taking a few of those essential things that you want to have in your space at work if you're out of the house early. Um, some of my favorites, um, just having a container of yogurt, whether it's a big container or um, individually packed. Um, Keep going the wrong way, sorry. So um, for what to have for breakfast, let's also set that there. Um, one of my favorite recipes to do the night before, this comes into my organization the night before, is my crock pot steel cut oats. I think my crock pot's still dirty from the last batch, but um, the slow cooker, you know, you can cook this. Um, this recipe calls for two apples. Um, you can use milk and water or vice versa. You can use one or the other. Um, you can add cinnamon, ginger, spices, um, anything you want in there, any kind of fruit, your oats. And you just add a, higher, a larger amount of water to cook it overnight. That way when you get up in the morning, it's all ready to go. Um, it cooks depending on how much you cook. I love using the mason jars. Um, and you can do it once and portion it out and have it ready for the whole week. So you can have your half cup, or I, I think it's hard to eat more than a half a cup of steel cutouts, but have five of these ready to go for the work week. Um, have them portioned out. You can add your, you know, so that would be, as we go back to our plate, this would be our complex carbohydrate. Um, if we want to balance that, have a protein with it. Um, good sources would be like a plain yogurt, um, any kind of added nuts. Focusing on boosting brain power, add those really powerful antioxidants from, um, you know, it's got the apples, but add berries, add raspberries, blueberries. Um, if you want to look more into adding fiber, use things like chia seeds or flax seeds, exactly, thank you. So all those things you can really, I mean, you can put it in when you're cooking, you can add it after if you want a little bit more of a texture or crunch. Um, this cookbook is really fun. I just got it. It's this mason jar. You can actually, there's recipe in here for, um, for the oats. And you actually just cook the steel cut oats on the, on the um, stovetop for 10 minutes. You put them in the mason jars. You seal them shut tight, and they cook the rest of the way. They're ready in the morning. You don't even have to cook it all the way overnight. So that might be something you can do ahead of time. Um, or if you have 40 minutes in the morning, you know, you can cook those um, in the morning time. You know, for days that you're, you know, maybe hit the snooze button too many times, you can still mimic a meal like that. You can still do um, a muesli or a granola. Um, just looking at the ingredients, you can still do yogurt. Um, or if you have time, I think eggs are a, ter a terrific way to start your day. Balancing the plate, it's a, eggs are a terrific protein, um, and they're such a great vessel for produce. 
Um, a lot of people think, how can I, okay, they can maybe apply that plate and do it for lunch and dinner, but how do they do it for breakfast? How, you know, when you look at those recommendations, have two to three servings of veggies for breakfast, how are you gonna do that? Eggs are a terrific way. Yeah. It's perfect. That's a perfect start to your day. Um, if you do like a little bit of complex carbs with that, the sprouted um, Ezekiel bread, the English muffins, the toast, those are another really great way. Or you can use the steel cut oats and make more of a savory if you don't want sweet. You can add herbs and spices and a little bit of sea salt. You can add a little bit of cheese to it. Um, maybe a little feta or a little crumbled blue cheese and add those eggs and the avocado or maybe some cilantro or some different herbs. You know, you can make it, you can add beans, you can do whatever you want. Um, I think it's, in my house I always have whole grains cooked in, in the fridge um, and sometimes that just dictates what I'm going to have with my breakfast for a grain or with my salad for lunch. Um, but I think just having those ready to go um, makes meals a lot easier. Yeah. Yeah. Uh huh. Oh, nice. I've never done that. That's perfect. And you don't cook it, you just put the lid on and shut it off. Oh, that's great. So oats are, they're, they're very versatile. I feel like you can't go wrong with them. Um, hard boiled eggs are another great thing. I usually do a half a dozen at the beginning of the week. Um, for those days where you just can't get it together, you're running out the door, grabbing a couple hard, hard boiled eggs for breakfast or for snacks. Um, a lot of these can roll over into the different um, meals or snacks that we're talking about. Um, I use a lot in my house the little mini muffin tins. You can make little egg dishes loaded again with vegetables. Um, if you have enough, they always fly through my house. I never get them to the freezer, but they freeze really well as well. You can put them in the freezer and store them for up to, um, I don't know, probably six weeks, four weeks. They stay. For a month, yeah, I might never make it that long. So, <laughs> do you do those as well? I love cooking, and I know maybe it's in the last, but I just come by because I want to look at it while you're teaching, but I know a lot of things. Yeah, yeah, that's good. <laughs> yeah. I don't understand how you do it that muffin top. So, you would do it just like you were doing, um, like making a quiche or mixing the eggs. You essentially just take a bowl, you mix your eggs in there, you load it with peppers, greens, mushrooms, whatever kind of vegetables you like, and you can just pour them, just like you would make a muffin, into the mini muffin tins and bake them. Um, I also love the, um, I think most of the grocery stores have the pre-made pie shells. Lucky's has the spelt green um, pie crust, and those are really quick and easy. I can make two, quiche, two quiches that last um, and start us off really well throughout the week. Um, just kind of finding some of those, for me, that's a hurdle. I know I can make a pie crust and it's not that difficult, but am I actually going to do it? No, I don't have time. <laughs> so finding some of those quick time-saving things that are healthy that you can work into your regimens, I think is um, really helpful to get throughout the week. Um, what else for breakfast? Anyone else have any questions? Yeah. Yeah, I like chia seeds. I mean, they definitely have a um, place to use them. They're, um, I use them a lot for a good protein. Um, they're a binder, so you can use them for binding um, ingredients together. Um, I do a lot of just like little power balls. Um, they're great to add into those. Um, so I, I just make them for, they're just like little energy balls. Um, you can make them, I make them a lot for snacks or for just quick breakfast on the go. Um, and you can, there's, I didn't break a recipe for them, but essentially they've got some kind of a grain typically, like an oat, a nut butter, nuts, seeds, um, chia is oftentimes included in them, maybe some cocoa, dried fruit. Um, and you can just roll them up into little balls and put them in the freezer or if they go quickly in your house. Just eat them. Mm -mm. Yeah, yep, yep. Anyone else?
anyone else have any uses for chia that you love? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, they're great in smoothies too. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yep. I'm coming to your house for breakfast. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Smoothies are another really great way to start um, to start the day, or for snacks or lunch. Um, when you look at the plate, um, how do you think you could? How, do you, how how can you transform that into a smoothie? How can you find all those food groups? I feel like smoothies can sometimes get us into trouble with what we're putting in them. You know, because you can load them. They're oftentimes really heavy in the carbohydrates or the fruits. But what are some ways to add proteins or to add those high fiber plants like vegetables? I make one with cucumber, kale, uh, orange juice from a species of insurance. Can you get can you all hear? And I put on like grapefruit, I have a species too, and then ice cubes and you blend everything and put on chia, flax seeds. So we've got chia, flax, what are the other protein? Kale, cucumber and uh, orange juice. Uh -huh. Yeah. That's good too with the citrus and the kale. Uh huh. Perfect. Yep. Yep. Yeah. So yes. Yeah. So I love to have banana, banana in my smoothie, and I feel like banana has gotten beaten up lately for being bad. Because it's so high in carbohydrates. Well, I have I have a banana protector, so obviously I use a lot of bananas in my house. <laughs> no, the banana's not bad. <laughs> it's a high carbohydrate, and you have to look at portion sizes too. I mean, obviously, if you're eating a banana this large, it's going to be a pretty high carb banana. You know. Just choose a small banana and no, enjoy it. But what are you balancing those carbohydrates with? Perfect. So you've got another high fiber green vegetable and a really nice um, nut butter that's going to be good quality fats and proteins. So it's a perfect balance. And when you go around that plate, you're kind of touching on each one of those um, areas. Maybe a smoothie with banana and orange juice and berries and you know, just, and what? Or just all high in fruit? It might just, it might not sustain you throughout the day. It might just be a really high carb load. Um, so balancing that. Do you need the balance all at once? Or can you have like a high carb smoothie and then later have nuts and then later, you know, just kind of? When we look at sustained energy um, and blood sugars and all of that, it really does help to have it balanced within one sitting. Um, of course, it's not always going to be perfect, but I think the more we can focus on having those food combinations gets us through the day a little bit better. And everybody has to kind of look at what works for that. You know, everybody is so different in terms of what their body needs. So if that suits you well, if that, you know, gets you through the morning. Um, yeah. Any, was there any other questions, comments? Okay. I don't think any of you need to do this because you're all like, having breakfast. Um, overcoming excuses for breakfast. I'm not hungry in the morning. How many people don't feel hungry in the morning? Julia? <laughs> sometimes? Yeah, sometimes I don't either. Um, oh, here are my hand outs. Well, 
Mm -hmm. Yeah, sometimes we have to look at that late night eating. Sometimes that gets in the way of our hunger in the morning. Definitely. Um, and if we are late night snacking, um, trying to curb that, try not to eat after dinner if we can, or if we are, maybe just have a, sna a small balanced snack. Um, but also times our body, our, our body is regulated. So if we haven't eaten breakfast for a long time, we're not gonna have those cues. Our stomach's not gonna be communicating to our brain to signal it, to tell it that it's time to eat. If we don't ever eat until 11 or 12, that's our clock, those are our patterns. Um, so, um, starting with something small. You don't have to have a huge breakfast, even if that's just a handful of nuts when you get up, you know, at that typical breakfast time. Just starting with a nice fiber, a nice protein, that can start communicating that, you know, making that conversation happen between your gut and your brain and saying, you know what, this is a really important time. I'm going to break that fast of not eating all night long, and now I'm taking over, and it's time for me to fuel my body. Um, not on reserves, not on what the body's got stored, but what I'm going to be giving it today. And you can start small and just add slowly. You don't have to have a giant sit-down breakfast. I think we touched on this, not having enough time in the morning. I think it's just looking at how we spend our time. We all have the same amount of time. It's just looking at what's important and how we structure our time. So maybe if the morning's um, too busy, looking at how we can maybe adjust that nighttime, those nighttime patterns getting to bed earlier, setting the alarm clock maybe just 10 minutes earlier could really help us to get those things done that we need to get done in the morning. Um, if there is anyone else that's living in your house that can help, just kind of assigning roles, knowing who's doing what. Maybe one person can take on breakfast while someone else is doing something different. I think if we have that support, it can be helpful for getting everything done that we need in the morning. Um, some people who are focusing on weight loss or not gaining additional weight think that by skipping breakfast or skipping meals, that might help. And there's actually no research to support that. Um, oftentimes we see it doing the opposite um, with going sustained, with, with going long periods of time between meal. We're actually slowing down metabolism and slowing down how we um, shift our weight and use our energy. So actually having regular meals and regular snacks can actually promote um, faster metabolism and maybe more potential for weight loss. I don't like breakfast food. I don't really eat that much either. Um, I'd rather eat green curry every morning for breakfast, <laughs> to be honest. <laughs> and that's fine, it doesn't matter. Um, you don't have to eat the traditional American breakfast. Eat whatever you want, have leftovers from dinner if that's what sounds good to you. Just using that plate, starting your um, day with a good quality protein, some high fiber plant-based foods, um, and a good complex carb is really what we're looking for. If you don't have all those components, it's okay. Just kind of learn what, what fits for your, what gets you through the day, through the morning. Making sure your house is well stocked. Um, and I think being a good role model is a really important one on this list. Um, if you do have small people in your home, um, our kids model us and for all of our meals, not only breakfast. But kids going to school without breakfast um, is really um, a deal breaker. I don't have a lot of deal breakers with nutrition, but um, no breakfast is, um, it, it, having breakfast is a must in my head, especially for little kids. Um, I know my kids are sleeping 12 hours. If they were to not have breakfast, by the time they got to lunch, that would be probably 15 hours of them not eating anything. And we can't expect our kids or us to really get to work or get to school or get to whatever we're doing in the day and do it well um, with a clear mind and um, an ability to do a good job if we haven't fueled ourselves. So I think that's really um, important to model that, even if they just see you packing it or taking it with you. Um, but knowing that we're having those mealtime patterns, I think, is really important. Okay, anything else on breakfast? Anyone else have any? Yeah. Yeah, it'd be great. <laughs> Eggs are so versatile. I think they're a terrific food. Um, so snacking, essentially, we're going to use that same plate, that healthy plate model, and just downsize it. Okay, so making those portions smaller. When we're looking at a mealtime plate, probably a nine-inch plate. When we're looking at snacks, I don't know, maybe four. 
Um, but I think with snacking, it's really important uh, to also use a plate. Sit down, be mindful. Um, plate up your food so you know what it looks like, especially as you're trying to focus on pairing foods and balancing ingredients. Um, I think those are just some good keys. So other keys are choose, choose, choosing your foods wisely. Um, what do we see a lot in the standard American diet for snacks? Chips, sugar, beautifully packaged foods with a lot of marketing and beautiful labels. They look good. They come in these little, they're 100 calorie snack packs. That's what a snack is, right? You buy it in a box on a shelf and it's, that's, those are our snacks. They're high in sugar, they're high in salt, they're high in fat. So snacks don't have to be something that have been packaged and created for you. You can make your own snacks really, really healthy. Um, it can be any of these foods up here that we've talked about already for breakfast. Those can be included for snacks too. Um, just watching portion sizes. A lot of times, you know, our snacks are meant to bridge us from one meal to the next. They're really not intended to fill us up. You know, with our meals, we're looking to get about 80% full with our snacks, maybe 15, 20, I don't know. You know, it's just something to curb that appetite to get us to the next meal. So we really don't want to be full. So just watch those portion sizes. And I think that is um, where a plate can be helpful. A lot of times when we start, start stacking, we can get carried away. <laughs> and we don't really realize how much we've had. Um, snacking when you're hungry. When you acknowledge the fact that you actually are hungry, have something. Don't wait till you're ravenous, hangry. <laughs> you know, eat before you get to that point. Snacking mindfully, you know, snacking with intention, snacking mindfully. Um, and I have to work on this one. Not snacking in front of your computer at work. You know, take five minutes, walk away, get that snack, plate it up, sit down, take a breath. Um, acknowledge the fact that you're hungry and your body needs some nourishment. Not snacking in the car, not snacking when we're working or watching television. We're checked out. We're not paying attention to whether we're 20% full. If we're, you know, eating too much, what our portion sizes are. So that mindful eating and snacking is really important, I think. Proteins are a really good thing to snack on and those plant, those plant-based foods again. Um, as that chart showed at the beginning of the slide, how many servings of fruits and ve or vegetables that we're getting. This is a really good opportunity to um, make up for what we've missed on our plate. So really um, using, you know, there's so many food, like veggies right now in the store that are washed, ready to go, the sugar snap peas, the baby carrots, um, anything like that, having those quick and easy and ready to go, um, a great opportunity for snack fruits. Um, yeah. I've heard people say that baby carrots are a little bit excellent. So I feel. Can you talk about that? Um, you know, a fresh carrot grown here is probably the ideal. Yeah, those baby carrots, I don't know what they're, they're probably chlorinating most of them. Um, I think some of them have gotten a little bit better, like the little baby organic ones. I don't, I don't think they're using the same kind of processing with them. But if you can, on the weekends, you know, take that time to peel your own carrots and cut them, that's obviously the preferred way to go. Um, nuts are another really great um, snack, cho snack to have. Um, a good healthy fiber, protein, fat. Those are gonna pair really well with those high fiber plant-based foods that you're having. And again, making it routine and getting organized, having those snacks kind of planned out and acknowledging the fact that you're gonna be hungry probably between breakfast and lunch. And my hungriest time of the day is that three, four o'clock time. It's, I mean, I'm ravenous by then. I let myself get to that point. It's acknowledging that, you know what, I'm not gonna make it home from work and make dinner without being starving. So bringing something with you to work, whether that's an apple and um, peanut butter or a string cheese, those laughing cows are great, the little baby bells, they're just enough, they're portioned, they're ready to go. A handful of nuts, even something like, these are a nice portioned out serving of nuts. Um, those are really great snacks. 
Any questions or comments on that? Yes? I will say the one thing that I don't think you've touched on yet is how full you can feel by staying hydrated. And so, mm -hmm. Yeah. You know, a lot of times we get those signals exactly for what we think is hunger when in actuality it's thirst. Um, and making sure to check in with that. How much water have you drank before your meals, before your snacks? Maybe taking that as an opportunity to have a glass of water. Stay hydrated. At elevation where we live, we do. We need more than the average person. Um, and just really balancing that with every time you take time to eat, take time to drink. And starting with that can sometimes, if we actually start with water, give it a minute, reevaluate. Am I still hungry? Or was that just a cue for thirst? Um, it's a really important part of it. Yeah. Um. And then for lunches as well, um, you know, again, planning ahead, having those, week, those weekly um, menus are really important. Trying to focus on the healthy plate, balancing, balancing each of those food groups, um, and try new um, ingredients and recipes. If you have um, kids or even families, getting their input, um, I think, helps. No one likes to make a lunch or a meal and have no one eat it. So getting um, their feedback, getting some input as to what sounds good, what looks good, um, can be helpful at creating some nice lunches. Um, being organized with the supplies that you have, I think, can be really helpful. Um, just kind of have some demos up here for, you know, reusable, um, non-disposable, just kind of lunches that you can pack. There's adult ones, too that are really nice, the bento style lunches, make it convenient. Um, they make it easy to pack. Uh, oftentimes, dinner from the night before is what's packed for lunch the next day. Um, reusable containers, just different. There's a lot of different options. Um, again, this, I printed off a couple salads. I think lunchtime is a great opportunity for loading up on salads. These are some really good, Recipes that we can look at for a, changing our salads through the seasons, too. You know, people get bored with eating the same salad over and over again. So choosing your ingredients based on the season, what's available, and having variety can be some good ideas for lunches. I've kind of got out of doing this, but I used to really enjoy it, and I loved how my fridge looked in the in the morning when I had them packed. So you can do, again, the mason jars, which is a really fun thing to do. Um, and you can, pack, you can pack a week's worth of salads and just have them ready to go. You can make five of them, 10 of them, how many ever you want, and they're all packed. They've got you know, a lot of the a serving of the grains, serving of beans, loaded with um, veggies. Some of them even have fruits in them. One thing it doesn't include is uh, a good animal-based protein, so if that's something that you like um, or include in your diet, just serving, having that on the side, whether it's the leftover protein from the night before or um, even some of the wild-caught salmons or tuna um, can be good. Bringing your hard-boiled eggs with you can be a nice protein to add to it, um, your nuts and seeds. Yeah. I've got a question sure. about some of the uh, new interest in things like kombucha and kimchi. Can you talk a little bit about fermented foods? Yeah, certainly. Um, fermented foods are a great thing to add. Starting with breakfast, some of my favorite fermented foods. I, I think aiming to have at minimum one fermented food a day is a good goal. Um, fermented foods are touted for just feeding the good bacteria in our gut and really nourishing us. Um, so fermented foods can be anything that have probiotics to it. So like your plain yogurts, your kefir, those are good um, cultured foods that you can have in the morning time. Your kimchi, um, I, your sauerkrauts, any of those fermented vegetables are a terrific thing to add. Um, do any of you eat any of those? Try them? Yeah. Yeah. 
they're great. They, um, they might taste a little bit stronger or different if it's not something that you've traditionally um, had in your, you know, had in your daily diet. They are a different taste. They're not sweet. They're more sour, tart, tangy. Um, but it's a great taste to get familiar with, um, and the benefits that they add to our gut health are um, off the charts. So trying to get some of those in. A lot of people are using probiotics in terms of capsules, but I think anytime you can get the real food source of it, um, you're just going to get so much more than what you're actually getting in a probiotic supplementation. Um, so I think any of those are really terrific sources to add anywhere you can. Oh, and the, sorry, and the kombucha is a really nice, when we're looking at what we're drinking, um, you know, people get tired of just drinking water. They think, what can I drink? You're telling me I can't drink soda and juices and all these other things that offer flavor. I think kombucha is a really nice, um, just daytime, some, something to have that breaks up the mundane water intake if you get tired of drinking water. So um, they're, they're really terrific terrific option. Even making drinks with apple cider vinegar is another really great thing to do. Um, you can use different types of herbs. One of my favorite this summer was um, an infusion with apple cider and watermelon and mint and just letting it soak and putting it with sparkling water. You're making kind of your own little tonics and healthy drinks. Um, or just bubbly water to, you know, carbonated water. We always have at the hospital, we've got the infused waters every day and it's such a nice treat to just getting some more flavor in when we're trying to increase that water intake. Can you too much when it comes to probiotics? Like just thinking about intake through kimchi. I mean, the average person, I would say no. Um, I, I don't think so. I don't think so. How much are you taking in? Do you, do you drink a lot? I mean, I don't... I, I, yeah, I mean, there is talk when you really get into it. There, there are conversations that you can overdo how much with the fermented foods, but I think it's very rare that someone could possibly get that much fermented foods in. Just, so I don't, I don't think there's really a risk for getting too much in. <laughs> um... <laughs> It's, I don't, even, I don't even know how to describe it. I don't know. I've never made it myself. Um, Susie's made it. What all goes into kombucha? It's just ferment. It's, it's the, that you, the, the sugar ferments. For rehydration. Mm -hmm. uh, more so even than like things like coconut Yeah. Maybe it was just because I was sick of drinking water. No, I agree with you. I agree. Mm -hmm. Do you have a question? She asked it. Okay. On the fermented. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, what else? I feel like that was the end of my slide, but I feel like I had some more things I wanted to talk about. Um, when we're talking about transitioning away from a lot of the sugars, what, are, what do you find that's great to sweeten with in your house? Cinnamon. Cinnamon, ginger, molasses, cocoa, maple syrup, honey. Those are all really, um, I mean, obviously we're still going to bake in our house and we're going to want a little added sweetener. So don't get the message that sweetener is completely bad or off the, uh, off the plate, but just kind of looking at the quality of sugar and the amount that we're getting and going back to more of those traditional um, natural sweeteners. Um, what else? So as like when you're in the grocery store too, I think um, when we're looking at ingredient lists, it was just one thing I wanted to touch base on quickly. Um, any food, I think peanut butter is a really good example. You know, any food can have a very different profile. So when we're talking about um, looking at the quality, improving quality, you know, making sure to look at ingredient lists. We've all been trained to, when we look at food, just look at the, nut the nutrition facts. 
and focus on calories. And my belief, I think that a calorie, uh, there's all different qualities of calories. So getting away from the quality or the calorie and looking more at the quality of the food can really help shift um, the nutrition that you're getting for all of your meals. So these three, pro these three peanut butters here have a very different profile. The one with just peanuts and salt is really all you need. It doesn't have to be organic, but um, you know, we look at this one and we might think that the lower fat peanut butter might be a better option, but the list of ingredients is five lines long of all sorts of uncertain foods. Um, so that's just one thing to start thinking about too. Has anyone heard of Michael Pollan? I had a couple of, um, just I, this food rules book is a really fun one. Um, and I just highlighted, I'll read a couple of them. Just kind of some fun rules to take with you that kind of resonate and stick in your brain for when you're going to the grocery store or you're making your food. Um, these ones I kind of thought were more for breakfast um, or lunch. If it, if, it's not food if it arrives through the window of your car. So anything that's coming through, delivery, fast food, restaurants, maybe reassess. Don't eat breakfast cereals that change the color of your milk. So for any of the kids that come through my office, I always give them that rule as their take home. <laughs> um, breakfast like a king, lunch like a prince, and dinner like a pauper. So shifting maybe just the portions and how much we're eating, um, really nourishing ourselves in the morning when our bodies need it the most. Um, just a couple more, just because I think they're so interesting. Um, do all your eating at a table. Simple concept, but something that might be difficult to actually implement in our house. And try not to eat alone. A lot of us are, you know, busy. Fam even, if, even in family settings, people are eating alone. Parents eat, you know, mom and dad are eating separate times. Kids are eating when they, you know, everyone's coming and going at different times. If you can, if you can't do it every day, at least try to find a couple of days a week that everyone can come and eat together. Um, if it came from a plant, eat it. If it was made in a plant, don't. Um, treat meat as a flavoring or a special food occasion. You know, trying to, for so long on the, our plate, the meat has been the main course, it's been the main dish. And trying to shift that plate as this healthy plate model and have meat more as a component of that plate, but your vegetables as the center, as the main course. Eating your colors, you know, focusing on that. Um, eating rainbow, focusing on getting all of those colors in the rainbow in within, within the week if you can't do it in a day. And then limiting your snacks to unprocessed plant-based foods. So those were just some. If, um, if you liked any of those, this book is really interesting. And he also has a lot of other really motivating um, nutrition-focused books. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, but there's also different things you can do. Yeah. Yeah, the pita pockets, have you ever tried those? The pitas are really good, or even just some of the wraps can be really fun. But like, what do you put in instead of like a turkey? Yeah. You tried hummus and veggies? Yeah, so, okay, so. Um, anytime you can get veggies, avocados are a great spread. I think it's nice to have something, you know, spread on it. So either doing like a ricotta or a, um, like a hummus or even like that cream cheese. Those are kind of nice foundations to hold everything in place. Um, you can do any of the, um, like the wild salmon or um, any kind of meat. You know, you can even do, if you had spaghetti and meatballs the night before, you can do like a little, like the little mini. I know we do really small ones at our house so they can eat them in their lunches with different things um, for the protein. Um, let's see, what else? Not the spaghetti, but just like the little, the little meatballs. Like I do them without the sauce and you can just add them then to different kinds of sandwiches or not have them with a sandwich, just have little meatballs. Um, what else can you do for a sandwich? Pesto mozzarella. Yeah, I like the little caprese sandwiches. Those are actually like the fresh mozzarella and pesto. 
What kind of, yeah, what are they? What are the? Almond butter? Eggs and dairy. Mm -hmm. They do, um, will they eat more like Asian in kind of like, yeah, I mean they make like the nice rice wrappers or even like the seaweed wrappers. I don't know if you're like how young your, or old your kids are or what they're interested in, but those rice wrappers can be really good for making different kind of like spring rolls, veggie rolls. Um, you can do them with, you said egg allergy, but you can do them with um, like tofu or veggies or even adding some meats in those. Um, what else could you do? Yeah. 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 Mm hmm. Mm hmm. Mm hmm. Mm -hmm. And there's some really fun, um, I know I was trying to get a resource list together, but there's some, some really fun cooking blogs out there for moms who are packing lunches um, that give kind of refresh your repertoire of what you're making. Even using fruit, I did one, you can take just the apple, it doesn't have to be sandwiches, I know we get so locked into the sandwich, but you can take the apples and slice them this way and layering them with, you know, different ricottas or almond butters or different things like that. You can put dried fruit in there. Um, you know, I send my kids with just a half avocado. You can put a hard boiled egg in there. You can put tuna in there. You can put the meat in there, whatever you want, whatever they like. Um, you can put different grains in there and it's all packed and like in its own little shell. You can do different, um, like with the wraps, like with the Swiss chard or with the Ved with the greens, you can do wraps. Sometimes they'll eat that. Um, have you ever tried, uh, did you say weed allergies as well? No. no. The, um, I know in my house, the soba noodles are a huge hit with, um, like you could do a, the almond butter, but you can make like a sauce with that. Um, you can load it with veggies. I know when we do like the edamame and, um, Whatever kind of veggies you like, you can do the Julian carrots or tomatoes or um, different things like that to go. Bean salads are always fun. Um, guacamole, just even blue corn chips and guacamole, quesadillas. You know, those all pack pretty well. 